What a privilege and a joy it is to welcome you to church this morning, all of our friends who are here in person and those who are part of our online and television congregation. We welcome all of you. I'm especially thankful and excited to introduce to you our guest preacher this morning. I contacted Bishop Swanson back months ago to see if he could speak as a part of our Holy Week series. And we weren't able to work that out with the calendar, but I believe that that was orchestrated because I can't think of a better Christian leader, denominational representative, to preach on Pentecost than our guest bishop this morning. Bishop James Edward Swanson Sr. is the resident bishop of the Mississippi Conference of the United Methodist Church. He was elected to the Episcopacy in 2004 and was assigned to the Holston Conference, which is the Episcopal area located in Knoxville, Tennessee. He served there for eight years and then was assigned to the Mississippi Conference. And he began there September the 1st, 2012, less than a week, less than a week after the Hurricane Isaac devastated the Mississippi coastal communities. So he was able to hit the ground running, so to speak, to help that area recover both physically and spiritually. His contagious spirit of hospitality and determination to excel at the you being the you you were created to be is a hallmark of his ministry. He has brought life and laughter, light and joy to the congregations, more than 1,030 that he is responsible for throughout Mississippi, but also churches all across the United States and literally around the world. Bishop Swanson has served as the general, the, uh, general commission of United Methodist Men as the president of that organization, he was reelected to the post following his service in the quadrennium of 2012-2016. He is a member of the International Association of Methodist Schools, Colleges, and Universities, serves on the board of trustees for Emory University, Rust College, Millsaps College, and is past chairman of the board and current member of the board of trustees at Gammon Theological Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia. He has preached all over the world in Japan, Korea, Brazil, Russia, Estonia, Chile, Canada, the Holy Land, Egypt, Liberia, the Sudan, Uganda, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and throughout the United States. Bishop and Mrs. Swanson have six adult children and 15 grandchildren, more than all of the accolades and the awards and the honors that he has been given. His spirit of passion for Christ and for the Holy Spirit shines through in his daily conversations, not just in his powerful preaching. Most of all, I'm so thankful to be able to call this great Christian leader my friend. Would you please help me give a very warm Epworth welcome to Bishop James Edward Swanson, Sr. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Well, good morning. It is so good to be with you on uh, this Pentecost Sunday. Um, in fact, you, you followed the script so well. It's almost as if... Uh, sent it ahead of time and that was the first thing that you did just now was when I said good morning and you said it back to me and I didn't have to ask you to say it again. Um, <laughs> some places I go when I say good morning I always have to say mm. yeah but you did real well. Uh, thank you so much um, Stephen for inviting me to come and to be at this very historic uh, congregation and to be a part of this uh, worship experience on the birthday of the church. A lot of people do not know that this is actually the birthday of the church, Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended in a very spectacular way. Uh, and I will show my age now in a kind of Cecil B. DeMille's way, uh, when you really think about it. Uh, you talk about uh, tongues as a fire descended and sat upon each one of them. And then this miracle of speaking in tongues in such a way that those who were there could hear and understand what others were saying, even though they were speaking in their own language, those who were listening could hear it in their own language. I mean, this was, this was spectacular, you all. This was really uh, an awesome event that was going on at that day and time. It is God's way of getting the persons in Jerusalem that day, getting their attention. 
and saying, I'm getting ready, or I am even now doing something spectacular, and you need to take a note of what I am doing. The birthday of the church. There are a couple of things going on here that I want to try to make sure you, uh, you see. One is that um, you're seeing a transference of power, authority, and also responsibility that is going on. I think a lot of times people really don't see this, but that's what's happening here. Up until this point, Jesus in his earthly ministry is leading the movement of God. He is the visible demonstration that God cares and that God is concerned about humanity. He is that visible uh, expression of God's love for the world. But if you really look at it closely, that limits his ability to be on display because that only means that wherever he is physically, then those who are there with him physically get a chance to see God on display and see what God is doing. But God does not want to be limited by space, place, nor time. What happens with the coming of the Holy Spirit, God is transferring all of that visibility from one person to many persons so that God can physically be present all over the world. And everyone in every setting and in every language and in every tongue and in every condition can know who God is. The most amazing thing about this is not just the language, you know, whether you're speaking in Spanish or German or Swahili or none of those things. It is the most amazing thing that God is speaking your heart language. That's what's important here. Because even though you and I speak English or we speak our Americanized version of it, amen. Uh, being now living in Mississippi, I realized that even when I lived in, in, in Knoxville, uh, we spoke Appalachian, amen. And the way you, you know, it's Appalachia, amen. Uh, that's a whole different version. But even then, it depended on what part of Appalachia you were in for you to be able to reach my heart. And to say to me in words that uh, translated, not just my mind, but my heart, where you reach me on a level that I needed to be reached on. And so many of us sometimes think that just because we say the words that it touches someone's heart, that's what God really wants to communicate to us. Not just intellectually, but God wants to communicate to our heart that God loves us with a love so powerful that God is even willing to come down, condescend, and be with us. And so this coming of the Holy Spirit is how God's doing this. So let, me, let me help you kind of go walk with me a little further, if you will. Because what God's great desire is, is to impact the world. To impact the world. And what God has figured out is that the best way to impact the world is through individuals, through people. So that when you begin to understand not only how God loves you, but as your life is individually transformed, everywhere you go, you take the message of transformation just by simply showing up. I, I remember as a, as a young man, I just uh, finished my tour of duty in Vietnam. And, and during that time, I was, at that time, I was a part of the Church of God in Christ, Pentecostal denomination. And, and we had this, this saying, and I hope it doesn't offend you, but it was just our saying. And that was, we don't smoke, we don't chew, and we don't go with girls who do. Amen. <laughs> that, that, that's, that was our church. We were very strict uh, because we wanted to, everybody to know we were godly folk. And, and so, but when I left and went into the army, I was doing everything I could do to debunk that theory. Amen. <laughs> Uh, and so I wasn't a really good witness of my church. I was a good witness of a young man who wanted to sow his wild oats. And I was out there doing whatever I could do. But when I arrived back home, I had two good friends of mine, uh, a guy named Charles Hill and a guy named Deontre McDaniel, who were determined that James was going to fall back in line. And so they came to visit me. And they happened to be much younger than I. And they came to see me, to pull me back into the fold. 
Now, what they did was they demonstrated to me, you know, beyond the making sure I kept the right rules, what they really demonstrated to me was they cared about James. And they would visit my home, and they would talk to me, and they would remind me that it was through their relationship with me that they came to know Christ, and that they were a part of the church, and they were saddened that I no longer wanted to be a part of the church. Well, it took them several months to get through to me. Several months, amen, because I was enjoying those oaks I was sowing. But finally, one Wednesday morning, I woke up very early and decided I would go to Wednesday morning prayer. And there were women there at that church. I never will forget it. And when I arrived, they couldn't get in the church. Nobody had the key to get in the church. It was the funniest thing. And one lady drove up just as I was getting tired of waiting. And I said, you know, Lord, I, I came, you know, to come back to you and you don't even have people here with a key to get into church. So I think I'll just go and this is my old neighborhood I used to hang out in. I'll go find me some friends. Well, just as I was getting ready to do that, Sister Brown shows up and she says, well, I don't have a key to the church, but I have a key to my garage that fits the church door. And she used that key for us to go inside. Well, about that time, my, my wild oats were kind of sad, amen. So we go inside the church and the ladies started laying hands on me and praying for me. And in the middle of that prayer, one lady says, because they were telling me other things to say, one lady just says, James, just remember God loves you. He doesn't want to stop you from doing anything. He wants to start a relationship back over with you. And I started crying. I never will forget. And it was through their witness that I really believe I'm standing here today as a bishop in the United Methodist Church. You see, all this talk about transforming the world, we're not going to transform anything until we transform ourselves. Until the world sees in us the very God we're trying to give the world, the world's going to reject us at every point. No matter how much we try to do good, if the good is not lived out in us, in our individual lives, people will reject us each and every day. No matter how many edicts and resolutions we pass, if we don't live those things out, the world will reject us every time. And that's what Pentecost was about. It was about empowering us to be able to live out what we said we wanted to live out. And when the Holy Spirit came, Transformation began in the lives of individuals, even that Peter that preached that day, because remember earlier he had denied the Christ. And now he's standing up in front of the whole city proclaiming who Christ is. Something happens miraculously when the Holy Spirit becomes a part of your life. You go from being timid to being one who speaks boldly about the Christ. That's what the church is about. We have this power to do what we could not do before the coming of Christ. So this transference goes on. It goes away from, from Jesus. Amen. You know, I, years ago, there was this big saying about well, what would Jesus do? And, and finally, one day I woke up talking about what would Jesus would do, and I heard the Lord say to me, well, what are you going to do? Because it's in your hands now. You are the only Jesus some people will ever know. The only Jesus some people will ever see. The only Bible about Jesus anybody will ever read. What will you do with what God has given you? Not what is the world doing. Not is what somebody else is doing. Not what some other church is doing. But what will you do, James Swanson? Because on the day of Pentecost, I gave you power to be able to do things that you could never do by yourself. That's how God impacts the world. Yes, I realize that, you know, we get together as a group and we make a lot of statements. But I've seen more people change to a simple act of love than you do from time to time at this church. Um, your pastor was telling me even about the movies you're getting ready to show. Well, you show the movie in them young man who was a rapper, right, shows up. And while they're out there watching the movie, he decides 
to just, you know, let the rest of the world know where he is. You know, young folk do that nowadays. You know, wherever they go, the rest of the world knows where they are. Amen. Uh, they will either uh, put it on, uh, well, for my generation, we do it on Facebook. Amen. I think they do it on TikTok, whatever that is. Amen. <laughs> and uh, they also do it on Instagram and all other kind of stuff. They just put it out there. You know, I'm out here having a ball. And this rapper said, I'm out here in the parking lot of Epworth United Methodist Church in Toledo, Ohio, watching a movie. And I'm here because this church is doing something for young people, and I'm having a great time. And you just did something, and as a result of opening yourself up so that others could come and watch a movie and be safe, not have to encounter COVID-19, this young man shows up, gives you more publicity for showing that movie than you can ever get for anything else that you would do. That's how you impact the world. By doing the things that the Holy Spirit moves in your life to do. And many times God will work a miracle because the miracle of love is inside of your heart, working on you each and every day so that people can see what God is doing. And then let me close with this. The most beautiful part of this is that then Luke in his rendition of Acts says, you young men and women shall prophesy. They'll tell the world what the world ought to look like and how it ought to be and how it ought to behave. Well, you know better than I do. Young folk are always telling us and how much better we can be. That's why we kind of get mad at them all the time, amen. They're always telling us how much better we can be. I mean, I have six children, amen. And um, they run in age from 50 to 30. And I've got a whole bunch of different generations telling me what I ought to be and how I ought to preach. I've got a son 30 now who's preaching. And I listen to him all the time. I say, well, I didn't see the scripture that way. He sees it differently. Amen. Young folk are always prophesying and telling us. Then I have this young daughter of mine who we adopted years ago, who has become so dear to my heart. She's blessed me so because she also... Uh, not only has given us two beautiful grandchildren, but she foster, you know, she does this foster parent thing. And I never will forget, as I close, I was in one of my moods, even as a bishop, I had gotten a little depressed about life and about things that I was trying to do in the power of my own strength. And I went home to Atlanta and was there with her, and I went and sat down in a chair, and she had this little girl who she was a foster parent named Janie, I think Janie might have been about five then. And I just said, Lord, I'm just tired. I'd give up. Well, Janie overheard me. Janie came from a family where her mother um, was addicted to crack cocaine and we had to, had to take her from her mother. Father, I didn't even know anything about him. Her mother lived under bridges and all of this kind of stuff. And, and when Janie heard me say that, she would call me grandpa. She jumped up in my lap and she said, what did I hear you say, Grandpa? Well, I was shocked that she even heard me. And she said, did I hear you say you give up? I said, well, yeah, I'm just tired. She said, let me tell you something. And she jumped off of me and did that woman thing, you know, put her hand on her hip, you know what I'm saying? And, and she started putting her finger in my face. She said, don't you ever say you're going to give up? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I mean, don't you ever say it. Because you can make it. Don't you ever, ever give up. And then she said, now repeat after me, Grandpa. I will never. I said, I will never. <laughs> give up. I said, I'll never give up. And then she jumped back in my lap and said, give me a hug. <laughs> <laughs> well, Epworth Church, don't you ever give up on impacting the world. You have the Holy Spirit. And today is your birthday to celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. So in the words of prophetess Janie, don't you ever, ever give up. Go and transform the world while God is transforming you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. God bless you.